Good day, mate. 40 here, doing the gorgeous Manly to Spitbridge walk and uh, listening to some some twaddle on Alex Kashuta's uh, podcast. So her guest is Soso Chunayoshka. You just come a lot of our sphere in general. Okay. Um, just by anchoring, okay, you have an... Let me find the right yeah, that's what I think that's sort of where my issues with people that... Christianity is like the singular most important factor of dissident right politics. Is that a state? Okay, there aren't any intellectuals who view Christianity as the singular most important factor in dissident right politics. I mean, Nick Fuentes may use that rhetoric, but uh, there's nothing he's, he says that shows he's got you know any grounding as a scholar of Christianity or theologian. I mean, no one is saying the things that uh, Sosa is fighting against here. Right, Christian nationalists aren't saying that. Right, they're not saying, not saying, oh, this is the be-all and end-all. That's all there is to it. There's uh, you know, nothing else that we need to investigate. We just have to look into the book. We'll get all the answers. No one says this. It's not actually all the answers rolled up in the one. Well, gosh. You know, I've known hundreds of religious people in my life. Nobody's ever claimed that uh, religion is all the answers rolled up into one. Just a uh, great job here, Sosa Chunyashka, you know, destroying a, a straw man. An incredibly powerful point. Like, who would have, uh, who would have ever realized these insights if uh, you hadn't come along and provided them? Just absolutely devastating to. Uh, a point of view that has never been expressed by anyone intelligent. Yeah, I, I also am slowly coming to that conclusion in the sense that I... I, I She's slowly coming to the conclusion that Christianity isn't the be-all and end-all. God, I love these, these beautiful red gum trees. Right, so until now she, she thought Christianity was the be-all and end-all and had the answer to all questions. I don't think so. It's not a little bit about you know, the, the appeal of something like integralism, just in the sense of, okay, you have an external moral framework, it's, it's an errant, it's based in some um, you know, external observer, and then just... Yeah, you cannot have objective morality unless you have a transcendent source of morality. So, there's a pretty good case to be made for the importance of having a transcendent source of morality, because then it becomes objective, there's objective good and evil, so if you can tie it into a divine revelation, yeah, you'd think you'd have a lot of advantages. By anchoring into something, uh, you you know essentially can build a, a more solid structure around it. Um, I don't think that's possible. I don't think necessarily religion is something that translates into, translates into politics in any good way. Um, you know, you, you won't. Have well, why? I mean, can uh, can soccer can soccer moms translate into politics? Can art translate into politics? Can podcasting translate into politics? If everything else can have a political dimension, why can't religion? The essence of politics, as uh, Carl Schmidt pointed out, is the friend-enemy distinction. And so the friend-enemy distinction can absolutely divide up on religious grounds. Some circumstances, that is the essence of the friend-enemy distinction. So I don't see how you can claim, oh, this should be separate from politics. It obviously has not been throughout have history. Politics and you won't have good religion if you, if you marry the two. And it's, you know, it's oh, you won't have good politics and good religion if you marry the two. Well, sometimes, in some circumstances, this subset of culture does become essential to the friend-enemy distinction. And whether or not you think that's good, that is the nature of reality, right? So you just want to talk from a naturalistic, humanistic perspective, then religion is a subset of culture that aims to provide comfort to people, and it provides identity in an in-group, and in-groups are explosively, you know, possibly political. So, like, why should this one aspect of life, you know, never have a political expression? I mean, of course it's going to have a political expression at certain times and certain circumstances. And there's no platonic, you know, ideal of uh, you know, good politics or good religion, right? They're just various adaptations to a complicated, painful, and difficult world. Is something that translate into, translates into politics in any good way. Um, you know, you, you won't have good politics and you won't have good religion if you. If well, the conservative 
political parties of Europe are basically Christian Democrats, right? Now they have uh, some grounding in a traditional conception of life and, uh, and moderately free markets. And uh, that seems to have worked for well over a hundred years in Europe. So just because America has this ideal that uh, church and state should be separate, doesn't mean that that's right for everyone in all circumstances. You marry the two, and it's, you know it should be. I think for for people in our sphere, and in general, it should be a matter of personal commitment, um, and nothing that you know that that goes into politics because it does ignore a lot of. Very oh, religion should just be personal. All right, so I mean, I, I'm guessing she's just been exposed to a particular type of religion that is just you know personal faith, but. Religion is something that is lived by human bodies, right? Bodies that lust, bodies that hate, bodies that fear, uh, bodies that see threats to its survival, uh, bodies that organize with other bodies in communities. Like, you just can't have religion uh, purely separate from the political and the social and the cultural. Important um, elements, like, for example, immigration. Like, under, under you know, a Christian system, you, know, you just come in, you say the appropriate words, and you, you make the appropriate uh, commitments, you know, honestly or dishonestly, and then politically, even, um, you become a sort of de facto citizen of the, of the... Oh, so which Christian nationalist groups advocate this? I'm not aware of any who do. All the Christian nationalist groups of which I'm aware want immigration restriction. So Christianity was married to nationalism for hundreds of years, right up until the 19th century was also married to a specific sense of people and race, right? So Christianity marched hand in hand along with strong racial and national identity up until about the 18th, 19th century. And then the mainstream of Christianity started diverging, moving in more egalitarian and universalist tendencies. But that's the product of a particular time and place. It's not, you know, just some essential, unchanging, eternal essence of Christianity. Sometimes Christianity is a force for racism, sometimes it's not. Sometimes Christianity is a valuable aid for national identity, sometimes it's not. It depends on time and place. You make the appropriate uh, commitments, you know, honestly or dishonestly, and then politically even, um, you become a sort of de facto citizen of the, of the new system. There's no re reason to exclude anyone or to have any sort of um, ranking or hierarchy or preference system if the, the baseline is okay, do you accept, you know, uh, the Lord, X or Y, depending on what your religious system is. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's a, a really big blind spot. Yeah, I think... What, what... Oh, that's a big blind spot by, by Christians who are interested in the wider society around them. And it's a blind spot that they've just, they've never thought of it before. I can tell Alex Kashuda brought it up and uh, Sosa Cherniashka it never occurred to them. Do you, do you Christian nationalists realize that? You've got this giant blind spot and, and now it's been exposed by Alex Kashuta and Soso, Soso Chernyoska. They just exposed this blind spot. They, they've, they're presenting ideas and analyses here and critiques that you've never heard of before. This is amazing stuff. It's also curious too, is if you look at like certain organizations that have been like the, the last proponents of immigration, particularly in America, like more often than not, they're like Christian charities. And I can empathize with the idea of like, you know, helping, you know, the meek and the poor, but... Yeah, sometimes Christianity has been a force for immigration restriction and racial and national identity. And sometimes it's been for diluting that and creating a more universalist and egalitarian and non-racial identity. It depends upon time and place, like everything else. At the expense of what, right? At the expense of the nation, the health of the nation, and the good of you know, the general population, you know, our people, so to speak. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of suicidal altruism. Above all else, you have to sort of look out for your own before you start worrying about matters of you know, charity and alms and that sort of thing. Yeah, and, and that's never occurred to Christians. Right? This is just some blind spot, right? I don't think there are many Christians who regard Christianity as a suicide pact. Right? Most, most Christians do not engage in their religion with the understanding that it will mean you know, the end of everything that they hold sacred. And yeah, you know, exactly what you said, it, it doesn't have all the answers, and particularly when it comes to matters of like race and, and the composition of a nation. And yeah, yeah, because Christians, they've never thought about race. 
when did you ever hear a Christian talk about race? Christians and never thought about the composition of a nation, never occurred to them before, right? That's absolute nonsense. Christianity went hand in hand for hundreds and hundreds of years with strong racial and national identity. Right? These guys have no sense of historicism. 